Go. Good morning. Oh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for coming out this uh, uh, rather cool Saturday morning to our first um, West Town Historical History Talk. Uh, my name is Stephen Rahoptig. I'm uh, one of the members of the West Town Historical Commission. We thought that it would be a nice thing to do. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm up there. Sorry. It's okay. We thought that it would be a nice thing to do. We're good again. Huh? It's okay. Yep. So we thought that since we had uh, so many members on the commission and friends of the commission who knew a lot about local history, in particular West Town, but also the surrounding county, it would be nice to have uh, some periodic pre little talks that we can have neighbors come together and learn um, more about our local history. So we're going to lead off with something that whenever I explain it to people, what the what the subject is, they think I must be making it up because it doesn't sound like it could possibly be true. And our, our expert in this is long-term member of the Historical Commission, David Walter. So I'll turn it over to him now. Thanks again for coming in. With Sam. All right. Well, today's topic, the strange story of West Town's Union Paroled Prisoner War Camp. Uh, this is going to be a story that has some humor. It has some tragedy. And at the end, I'll tell you a very improbable love story that came out of this camp. So the background on this is that uh, hardly anybody here in West Town knew anything about this this camp being here during the Civil War. And in the uh, 1990s, I was researching my uh, Civil War novel, and I was reading a book called If Thee Must Fight by Douglas Harper, who was associated with the, the Daily Local. And uh, in reading that book, that book, I come on a chapter that talks about a prisoner of war camp. Lo and behold, it's 300 yards from where I'm living. I had no idea that it had ever been there. So I started researching it, and Harper had uh, looked into uh, the files at the Chester County History Center, and there's all sorts of clippings, and he based his chapter in his book on these clippings, contemporary clippings from 1863, and a speech that was given around 1890 by one of the young men who was present at, at this camp. And that's all we knew about the camp. Um, let's go in here. So uh, being an historian and interested in um, uh, West Town Township, I decided I was going to embark on getting a marker from the state for um, the camp elder. And in 2013, the state awarded us that uh, that historical marker that's at, on Oakbourne at uh, South Concord Road. And I raised, uh, I don't know, $3,000 or whatever it was to, to put it there. And that's the first and the only to date West Town historical marker. So what, what did we know about it at the time? Uh, I thought there was 2,000 prisoners that had been here. Um, they were going to be exchanged. The community supported them. Uh, the government said the paroles were invalid. And after about seven or eight weeks, they went back to their regiment. And at the time we knew, I knew the names of about 22 soldiers that were at the camp, and that was it. Now, if any of you are into genealogy or historical research, you know how valuable the internet has become. And you also know that you need a lot of luck in finding uh, and researching uh, stories. So what luck did I have? This We put this in, it makes the daily local. 
within a week, uh, a gentleman I knew at Westminster Presbyterian Church comes up to me and he says, "My uh, one of my ancestors was the doctor at this prison camp. And guess what? All his papers are in the special collections department at Westchester University. Wow. <laughs> so I, I hustle over there and uh, they bring out this big box of the, the doctor's papers. And sure enough, there's all his records of who he treated at the camp. And suddenly I know the names of more than a hundred of the prisoners. Another thing that happens that the township solicitor at the time, Bob Adams, comes up to me and he says, uh, I live in the house that was once owned by one of the prisoners that were at the camp. And he gave me some information that we'll get into that his his daughter had provided when they, she, he, she did a deed search on his house uh, off of, on Ship and Lane here in, in, uh, in West Ham. So I'm starting to build more information. And uh, we really can't understand this, why this camp was here unless we understand the Battle of Gettysburg. I don't know if any of you were deep into Civil War history, but um, here's a little review of what happened. There were 50,000 casualties at the Battle of Gettysburg, and approximately 6,500 Union troops were captured by General Lee's Confederate Army. Um, as you know, Lee lost that battle, and he had to quickly get back to Virginia. He was going to be trapped in Pennsylvania by uh, the Union Army. So he offered all 6,500 prisoners a battlefield parole. And what a battlefield parole was, um, the, the army that captured you could let you go if the other army said, you know, we'll accept them. And you couldn't fight until you had been exchanged on paper for uh, a soldier in the other army. So like if you captured a lieutenant, you could exchange him for four privates, this sort of thing. So Lee has these 6,500 prisoners, and he, he doesn't want to take them all back to Virginia. Uh, all he's got to guard them is the remains of uh, George Pickett's division. So he offers a parole, and the officers in the Union Army that were captured warn the men, don't take the parole, it's not official. If you take the parole and go back and are captured on the battlefield, you can be shot. So most of the prisoners listen to uh, their officers, but about 2,000 of them say, hey, we want to go home. We'll, we'll accept being prisoners. So 4,500 of them get marched off to Virginia, and some eventually died in prison camps like this at Andersonville. Uh, in my research, I found that the, uh, say the 69th Pennsylvania was at the wall at Gettysburg. They had 13 prisoners captured at Gettysburg. And of those 13, nine of them died in Confederate prisons. So it was very, um, uh, it was very valuable that the 2000 who decided to take parole were made the right decision and didn't, didn't go back. There's a picture of, of Andersonville, a typical Confederate camp uh, for prisoners. You can see right there in the middle, there's the stream. That was their sole source of water. And the stream started up in the uh, Confederate camp. And it was their latrine and their garbage dump and everything. And then it ran into the Union camp. So you can imagine uh, the kind of disease and everything that was, was there. And 15,000 Union prisoners died at that camp. The conditions of uh, parole during the Civil War were governed by something called the Dix Hill Cartel. As I said, it was for the convenience of the capturing army. Uh, you were held by one's own army under guard, and you could not return to your regiment until you were formally exchanged for a soldier on the other side. And it was for a specific soldier. 
every soldier, they filled out a form in duplicate, one for the Union Army and one that the Confederate Army kept so that they knew later who, who could be exchanged. And if you were caught and you hadn't been exchanged yet, as I said, you were subject to being shot. The parole camps had to be established at specific places because both field commanders agreed to any changes. Well, at Gettysburg, General Meade did not agree to have a parole exchange. So these were, uh, we'll say, illegal parolees that were brought here to, to West Ham. And we'll see what happened to them. So there's 2,000 uh, prisoners take this, this bogus parole. Uh, 200 of them were paroled by Confederate General Jeb Stewart, uh, 200 cavalry uh, soldiers, and they were paroled at Dover. And the others were left there at, at Gettysburg when uh, Lee retreated. Well, they had been stripped of all their uh, clothing and their equipment by the Confederates, who certainly needed uh, the supplies. And uh, they marched them to Harrisburg, and they put them on the train. Uh, those that weren't injured and the walking wounded were sent by rail on the Pennsylvania Railroad to Westchester to a new camp for paroled prisoners. There were approximately nine 1,900 prisoners on hand in Westchester by July 12th. And an analysis of the regiment shows that most were captured on the first day at Gettysburg from the 1st and 11th Corps and the cavalry at Hanover. Here's a picture of a, a painting of the train that would have brought them in to the depot on Gay Street, which is basically across from... Um, you know, where Tekka Restaurant is, across the street is where the depot was. So they came from Harrisburg to what's now Malvern, and they were put on the, the railroad that goes from Malvern into to Westchester. So you can imagine it's July 12th, you're in Westchester, there's 5,000 people living in Westchester. A 35-car train pulls into the depot on Gay Street, and there's 1,800 people on that train that you didn't expect. You can imagine what would happen at the university if 5,000 students showed up one day and said, where's our room, where's our food, whatever. Well, the citizens in Westchester weren't ready for the, the uh, soldiers, but the Union uh, Army Command was. This muster roll that I'll mention in a minute shows that there were 1,861 officers and men at the peak of the, the camp's existence. And they represented more than 100 regiments from 14 states. The Battle of Gettysburg, virtually every state in the Union, I think except California, had uh, regiments represented. And they were all uh, captured at various points during the battle. One of the regiments that... Uh, had the most uh, prisoners here was the 11th Pennsylvania, uh, which had trained right here in Westchester and went off to war two years before the Battle of Gettysburg. They trained at Camp Wayne, which is where the university is today. And they got a little dog named uh, Sally. One of the young ladies here in Westchester admired one of the officers. And when they left uh, for the war, she gave that officer this, this little dog, Sally. And uh, Sally is right there on their monument at, at Gettysburg. She was very faithful to the regiment. Uh, when this regiment was overrun on the first day, Sally stayed there with the dead and wounded. And four days later, when the battle was over and they went back, uh, to recover the dead and the wounded. Sally was still there faithfully guarding the members of her regiment. Unfortunately, Sally was killed uh, early in 1865 in one of the battles near Petersburg. But I thought that was interesting because that regiment um, trained here in, in Westchester. So 
So there's 1,800 soldiers coming here to Westchester. Where are we going to put them? Well, a Captain James Elder had leased land for a U.S. Colored Troops training camp. Um, and that wasn't being used yet. So they decided, let's put the soldiers uh, there in this land we've already leased. And it was flat ground along the Westchester and Philadelphia Railroad and Goose Creek in Westtown, which is the present day intersection of Oakbourne and South Concord Roads. And the government hired a 14-year-old lad named John Heed to clear the brush for the camp. And in his speech in 1890, this is the lad who grew up and gave the speech, he says that he was there cutting brush on the um, the 12th of July, and he sees a horde of men being marched down the railroad. And he claims that he thought it was the Confederate Army invading uh, Westchester, uh, even though at that point they were already on their way back to Virginia. So he hides, and then he sees that these men are unarmed and they're wearing Union blue uniforms. So he comes out and he talks to them. And uh, the neighborhood women led by Mrs. Williams, whose farm it was, uh, they organized drinks and food for the men. I guess we should show you where the, the camp is. Well, here, here's what happened though. Well, James Elder is the headquarters of Turks Inn in, in Westchester. And he comes down from Westchester on the Wilmington Pike. And he signs a lease with a guy named George Fawcett to lease this farm here on Wilmington Pike. In fact, this building is on the farm. He leases this farm. Now, historians aren't supposed to conjecture anything, but I've always wondered why they didn't have this camp in, in Westchester. They had Camp Wayne where they had trained several regiments. And I'm wondering if it wasn't some prejudice against black troops, because this was going to be used by black troops to train. And maybe they wanted them a little further out of town than where the university is today. So Elder comes down and he, he writes a lease to George Foster. Somewhere here is going to be this camp to train black soldiers. Now, on the way back to Westchester, instead of just going back up Wilmington Pike and maybe paying a toll there at the toll booth in Rosedale, he decides he's going to go down Oak Horn Road and look, look at the countryside. And he comes down Oak Horn and he gets to the railroad here at Hemphill Station, which is now, which became Oak Horn Station. He finds this beautiful piece of land here under the Enoch Williams Swamp. And hey, there's Goose Creek running water. There's the railroad line. It goes right into Philadelphia. In fact, it goes right past Schuylkill Arsenal, where uh, a million uniforms and other equipment for the Union Army is being produced in Philadelphia. So this is beautiful ground. So he tears up the lease with George Fawcett, and instead of the camp being right here, down on the Williams farm. And Williams also has a sawmill, so there's going to be a, an ability to cut boards and things like that to use camp structure. So that's that's where uh, the camp is. And that's the way it looked uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it had never been built over until recently when uh, Wild Goose Farms residential community is on, on part of the land. And there's the Williams farmhouse, the, the owner of the land that, that was leased. Um, went by there this morning, there's a for sale sign in the yard. So if you'd like to buy the Williams farm, it, it's available. But it's been nicely renovated over the years. Okay, we've got a new camp now along the railroad. We have to supply it. So Schuylkill Arsenal in Philadelphia sends out tents. They sign uh, food contracts to, 
to supply the men. Uh, according to the paper, Mr. Shaw of Westchester wins the beef contract. Uh, 9.75 cents is approximately $3 a pound in today's money. I don't know if that's a good price or not. It was killed and dressed, but I doubt it had been uh, chopped up into steaks and whatever at that point. They buy ice, uh, they buy milk, they buy port wine, they buy uh, hens, uh, egg layers at 75 cents a pair. And they they build a little uh, a bakery on the the, uh, the camp site. Plus, the people in the neighborhood are always bringing in cakes and pies and this sort of thing. And what happens is there's a, a nice garbage dump that's forming there. So according to the papers, one of the local farmers decides, hey, I've got a sow and a bunch of piglets. I'm going to let them go feed on the uh, the garbage pile at the camp. Well, the soldiers had fresh roast pork that night. <laughs> Didn't work out for the farmer. Now, more than 100 of the men had arrived with slight wounds or illnesses, and they originally were accommodated in a gym at the uh, normal school or at Cabinet Hall on Church Street. But a hospital was hastily constructed at the campsite, and a contract surgeon was appointed at $100 a month to attend the hospital. And there he is. That's Dr. William Goodell. This is the gentleman who's uh, descendant let me know the paperwork was over there at uh, the university. Dr. Goodell was born in Malta, 1829, raised in Constantinople, first son of the first Christian missionary to the Turkish Empire. He was a descendant of William Brewster of the Mayflower, graduated from Jefferson Medical College, and he was a practicing position in Westchester. There's a picture of one of the pieces of paper that are in the file. On there is listed the name of everybody he treated and uh, their regiment and what clothing or supplies were issued to them. Beautiful handwriting. Uh, we'll see who did that in a minute, but that's the sort of paperwork I found when I went to Westchester. And one of the names on there, I, I don't show it, but his name was Levi Walters. Okay, Walter, Walters. Uh, I was interested, but it also said he was in the 1st Virginia Cavalry. And the 1st Virginia Cavalry was a famous unit in the rebel army. So I'm thinking, why is there a rebel soldier here at this camp. So I I go into uh, Google, I put in Levi Walters. I get down around the fourth page of Google and what do I find? Somebody has put online complete muster roll for Camp Elder. What luck. If his name had been Smith, I never would have pursued it. This lists all 1,861 officers and men and their commanding officers at Camp Elder. And beautiful handwriting and whatever. So I hit the jackpot because a prisoner was named Walters. How does that happen? So now I knew more than anybody else in the whole world about Camp Elder. And uh, I started to pursue some of the stories. The first thing I, I found in his file over there was um, he needed to requisition medical supplies for these hundred or so sick people. So he sends a long list to Philadelphia on the morning train uh, of the supplies he needs. And the surgeon in Philadelphia in charge of the medical corps is uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, Ebenezer Swift. 
<laughs> the afternoon train comes back, no medical supplies, just a note from Lieutenant Colonel Swift refusing, refusing to fill the medical supply because he didn't want to see him in duplicate. That was against the rule. And he wanted it written on both sides of the paper because it was a waste of paper the way that the doctor had done it. Now, you might think I'm just making this up that nobody would ever do that. Um, there's his letter that Dr. Goodell kept from Ebenezer Swift. So you think the government has red tape and rules today. They've always had it. And there's always been automatons like Colonel Swift to enforce the rules. So what happened was uh, Dr. Goodale and the various uh, pharmacists in Westchester reached into their own pocket and provided the medicines for about two weeks before they finally persuaded uh, Colonel Swift to send the supplies. But Dr. Goodale thought that was important enough to keep that letter. And here's, here's his uh, summary of the treatments he did for the various uh, soldiers while they were in the camp. And I summarized that there. There were 200 treated over seven weeks. Um, those that were seriously wounded were sent on to the hospitals in Philadelphia. He performed one amputation uh, of a thumb and he removed a piece of percussion cap that had lodged in one soldier's cornea. If, if you've ever seen a Civil War musket fired, you know they, they hold it up here, and there's a little percussion cap, brass percussion cap filled with fulminate of mercury that the hammer hits, and it explodes, and it shoots a spark, and it fires the, the bullet. Well, if you have that up to your eye, and that percussion cap explodes, it was pretty common injury to get a piece of brass in your eye. <laughs> he treated many serious cases of diarrhea, which he attributed to the prisoners eating the abundant ripe fruit in the neighborhood. It was, it was harvest time. He used an opium-based medicine to treat diarrhea. I, I don't know what they use today. He treated numerous cases of poison ivy. As you know, the woods around here are are filled with poison ivy. And he's also faced with numerous cases of rheumatism, which he claims that, that the drunks uh, that were prevalent in the camp were lying in the fields and everything in the dew and the cold mornings, uh, you know, gave them rheumatism. And he treated that with nitrate of potassium, which was invariably successful. Are there any doctors in the room? We know whether that was. Oh, well, that, that could be, because we'll, we'll get into that. Now, in this 1890 lecture that John Heed gave, the 14-year-old, he's now, what, in his 30s or 40, he, he, he gives a speech and he says, according to the newspaper, numerous soldiers in this camp died while they were there and their names aren't known and they were taken to green mound cemetery and buried in unmarked graves and their their uh, relatives have no idea where they the, these poor men were buried and after i read that i thought wait a minute wait a minute they were paroled so we know their names um they were with their buddies. Um, certainly they would have known their names. I actually went up to Green Mound Cemetery, walked the cemetery looking for, you know, grave unknowns, whatever. I, I tried to get the records, but apparently they have been destroyed in a flood or up in an attic. The rain came in on or something. There's no record of any buddy ever dying and being buried in an unknown grave at Green Mound. So then when I found these records of the doctor, what did he say here? Nobody died. He kept records of every sock that he gave to these soldiers that needed supplies, all their treatments, everything. Nobody died. 
And then when I got the full muster record, there's a column on here too that says died with nothing in it. So either John Heed was uh, misremembering his youth or making up this story, but nobody died while the camp was in existence. Another thing re researchers find as they go back that everything written in the newspaper isn't true today and it wasn't true then. <laughs> so you're, you're in camp now, what are you gonna do? Well, a lot of you are bored, so you read or you write letters home, you talk to the men and women who bring the treats into the camp. The local Quakers came in and lectured the men uh, several times. Another thing you might do is you you taunt and you pull pranks on the soldiers that are guarding you. Um, one of the, the guard units was a hundred and seven a company from the hundred and seventy ninth Pennsylvania, which was my great great grandfather's unit. Um, he was in Virginia, but they left one of the companies back in Philly to, at the hospitals as guards, and they brought them out here and they guarded. Them. Well, you've got combat veterans being held under guard by a bunch of green militia that their uniforms are brand new and whatever. So they're they're gonna do things like grab their hats and play keep away. And they they had a few of them um, show them how to fire their guns. And of course, somebody is almost injured by a, a gunshot and that sort of thing. What else do young men do? Well. They drink and uh, they would sneak past the guards and they'd go into Westchester and frequent the various taverns. On several occasions, according to the newspaper, the guards lined up on Market Street with their bayonets and herded them all back here to camp in West Ham. Some of the more enterprising ones hired themselves out to the local farmers. Um, it was harvest time and most of the farm laborers were off in the Union Army somewhere. So the local farmers needed help to bring in their crops. And then, then there were others who just merely wandered around the neighborhood. Um, they're young men, so they're visiting the local school girl and uh, chatting with the farm maidens, that sort of thing. Here's an example of a letter written home. Warren Freeman has extensive uh, letters on the, the internet that have been posted. And I was lucky to find one where he actually discussed um, being here in the camp. And he says there, uh, he likes to lay in his tent and he watches the trains go by and it's very pleasant just like it is back home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, he says, Westchester is a very pretty place, still is. We can buy articles at the store on very reasonable terms. So they weren't gouging these guys. Many of the inhabitants are retired Philadelphia merchants and quite rich. There are some very beautiful residences in town. I tell you, this is a great place for cherries. I never saw the like before. I go out every day and eat my fill, fill my dipper, bring them back to camp and stew them. So maybe he was one of the guys that had diarrhea. I don't know, but uh, it, it confirms what the doctor is saying about uh, the cases of diarrhea. Now, I said about visiting the girls. Um, I went over to West Town School and asked the archivist, Mary Brooks, if they had any evidence of, of the camp. And she said, yeah, we have two letters from students that wrote, they wrote to their mother and discussed the camp. She brought the letters out for me. And the first one said, uh, you know, some of these boys come and they hang around the school. And uh, the school must have fed them well when they came there. But Superintendent Knight told us, uh, he warned us against entering into conversation with them as we do not know what they might do. So they were hanging around West Town campus up here. And here's a, another letter that he, I've sent to a, a historian named Gary Gallagher, a prominent Civil War historian. Uh, there was a story 
historians know about um, from the Iron Brigade, which was one of the best Union regiments. And they they claimed in a book that when they were marching to Gettysburg, uh, an officer rode by them and said that General McClellan was back in charge. Uh, McClellan was a, had been fired after Antietam by Abraham Lincoln, and he, but he was well known to the men and very popular. So um, even though Meade had been appointed three or four days later, this officer didn't have a clue. And he rode by and he told the soldiers that McClellan was in charge. Well, one of the prisoners from the Iron Brigade tells this Margaret Gamir that uh, when they went into battle, they all thought McClellan was leading them and that they would not have fought half as hard if they had not thought he was at their head. Now, we know from history that the Iron Brigade was instrumental in stopping uh, the rebel attack on the first day at, at Gettysburg. And this is sort of confirmation that that uh, this misapprehension as to who, who was in charge actually had them play harder. And uh, Gary Gallagher, the story was very glad to to learn of this letter because it corroborated this heretofore unknown story about them being told McClellan was the boy. So what was the command structure of the camp? Uh, it was headquarters at the Turks Head Inn in Westchester. And Captain Elder was in charge for only 10 days. And he was replaced by a Captain George Shorkley of 51st Pennsylvania. His adjutant was a Lieutenant John Barber from the 97th Pennsylvania. The 97th Pennsylvania was Chester County's three-month regiment. And Barber um, was convalescing in Westchester at the time. So they picked him as second in command. And then from the ranks, they detailed this Sergeant uh, John Bridgewater as camp clerk. And he's the one whose beautiful handwriting is on uh, Dr. Goodell's paperwork and on, on this muster roll. So they picked the right guy because every name on there is, is perfectly legible. So who was Captain Elder? Uh, Pennsylvania native, been in the army for a couple of years, and he, he was relieved of command. And we don't quite know why. Uh, at the time, Westchester had a pro-Lincoln and an anti-Lincoln newspaper. So the anti-Lincoln paper, the Jeffersonian, praised the administration of, of Captain Elder whereas the pro-Lincoln uh, village record facetiously uh, congratulated uh, Elder on having friends, mainly the Jeffersonian, who were friends of Jeff Davis or the traitors. So I suspect that there was some sort of a, a political uh, connection here that got James Elder fired here, that uh, maybe he was a Democrat and the Republicans worked their, their will and got him removed. So he's replaced by Captain George Shortley, who by the end of the camp was promoted to a uh, major. He's from Lewisburg, and he'd been seriously wounded in Antietam, which was September of 1862. So he's still convalescing almost a year later when he's appointed uh, commander at, at Camp Elder. Lieutenant Barber was 30 years old. He's been, uh, he was discharged and living in Westchester and he got recalled to service for the, for the camp. Uh, Bridgewater, the clerk, he was detailed from uh, the prisoner ranks. And there was Private uh, Fred Holdridge from Charlotte, Vermont. He uh, was detailed to be the hospital steward. Among the prisoners, the, the ranking officer was Captain Samuel McIrvin. Um, his second in command or second rank was Lieutenant Newbury Wheeler. And there are the names there of four prisoners that we're going to talk a little bit about, because there's some interesting stories. 
Captain Samuel McIrvin was in the second New York Cavalry. He was born in Indiana in 1827. Now in John Heed's speech in 1890, he said that the camp's ranking prisoner was uh, a Captain Irvin from Indiana. You don't know how many hours I spent looking for Captain Irvin from Indiana. Online, the state of Indiana has posted the names of 17,000 officers from Indiana who served. He wasn't on there. When I got the muster roll, I found out his name was really Mick Irvin. And then using the internet, I found that, yes, he was from Indiana, but he was in the second New York Cavalry. When he raised his, um, his, his company in Indiana, there wasn't room anymore in whatever Indiana regiment was being formed. So they attached it to the second New York Cavalry. And he was captured by Jeb Stewart. Um, he's one of the, the cavalry officers that was captured. The second in command was Newbury Wheeler from West Virginia. Uh, you've heard often that the Civil War was brothers versus brothers. Here's a great example. Two of his brothers were in the Confederate Army. Three of his brothers and himself, he joined the Union Army. And one decided, I'm not making a choice. I'm staying home. So brothers versus brothers was, was real. And here's proof of it. He served in the West Virginia or the Loyal Virginia Cavalry. And he was in George Custer's Brigade. And he was captured uh, at Hanover uh, a day or two before the Battle of Gettysburg. Here's Corporal Southwell from Monroe County, Pennsylvania, or Susquehanna County. He was in the First Corps under General Reynolds, and on the first day at Gettysburg, they were overwhelmed in front of Seminary Ridge, and they lost half their strength and killed, wounded, and missing. Um, there's a cart of the Zeep showing him that uh, is in the Chester County History Center collection. There's the monument to 143rd. And he's one of those that um, uh, ended up working for the Jeffries family. And uh, he kept in touch with them after the war, as we'll see. Private John Dennett was in 3rd Massachusetts Light Artillery. They defended the wheat field on July 2nd and uh, managed to stabilize the Union line on Cemetery Ridge. He's one of those who wandered around the, the camp neighborhood. And there's a clipping from 1883 in the file that uh, notes that his canteen has been discovered in one of the local barns around here. And it's inscribed with his name and his regiment. And it notes, quote, it was frequently full of whiskey. And he asked his comrades, quote, who frequently drank from the same to return it if John still lives. Somewhere that canteen is floating around Chester County and we'd love to find it. But uh, So John Bennett, he's here, he's wandering around and he's got a canteen full of whiskey. Corporal Thomas Nolan, young lad from Ireland. He was born there in 1832. He, we think he came to the U.S. in the 1850s. He enlisted in Steubenville, Ohio. So he came from Ireland. He ends up in Ohio. He, he signs up with the 25th Ohio. And on the first day at Gettysburg, they're in the 11th Corps, and they're fighting at Barlow's Knoll, north of town. And they get overwhelmed by Confederate General Early's flank attack. And his company alone, uh, there's 15 men are captured. While he's here in the camp at West Town, he's hired by uh, Anthony Kirk to come and help at his farm, which is... Uh, off Little Shiloh Road on, on Shippen Lane. 
So that's what happens with Nolan. And the last prisoner we're going to talk about is Corporal Horace Cheever. Um, he's from Oswego, New York. And when he arrives in Westchester, he reports that he's, uh, he's sick from drinking bad water. And he claims that um, the rebels deliberately poisoned the spring where he, he drank and some of his friends drank. And he says his buddies died, but he's he's still hanging on. Um, I actually went and researched the records of the 147th New York, and once a month they would file a, a muster roll. And I looked at uh, the muster roll for May and June of 1863. Nobody ever reported sick or dying from poison. Um, Anyway, he, he arrives in Westchester and Dr. Goodell says he's, he's too sick to be moved to the hospital. We're gonna care for him in a local home here in Westchester. And he probably had dysentery. He, he wasn't poisoned by, by the Rebs. Now you can't see the top, but there in, in August, the soldiers are ordered to go back to the regiment and the camp is closed. Uh, General Darius Couch, who's uh, in charge of the uh, the Department of the Mid-Atlantic, uh, is notified by the War Department in Washington that these paroles are invalid. They were never authorized by General Meade. Therefore, these guys have to go back to their regiments and go back into the fighting. So in two phases, um, these soldiers are sent back to the regiment. Um, actually, half of them, according to the muster roll, had either deserted or never showed up at Camp Elder. So many of these soldiers were from Pennsylvania that they just took French leave and went home. But in any case, by September 7th, the camp is ordered closed and all the supplies are returned to Philadelphia. So Dr. Goodell in his papers kept the copy of the order from General Couch, telling him to close the camp down. And I think based on his experience with uh, Colonel Swift and the supplies, he keeps a copy of the receipt from the Westchester and Philadelphia Railroad and this receipt is feet long. He detailed every blanket, every cot, every surgical instrument, every uh, pair of socks, whatever. And he got a receipt for it. He didn't want any, any uh, controversy about, did he return everything? So that's, that's in his file too. Now, unfortunately, there was one death after the camp closed. Corporal Cheever's condition worsened. He was at uh, Margaret Paxton's home. She was a, a widow. And just the other week, John Hoppy and I were trying to figure out where she lived. And apparently she lived on uh, uh, East uh, Chestnut Street near the depot. So anyway, Dr. Goodell says that uh, Cheever can't be moved. He can't be sent back to the to the regiment, he can't be sent to a hospital. He's, he's too sick. So Cheever's father writes a letter to Mrs. Paxton on October 28th. There's, there's a copy of the letter. And what he basically says is, if my son's alive, give him all the care possible and closed is, is 20 bucks. However, if he's dead, Send me the twenty dollars back, and if he ship, if he dies, ship his body to Oswego, New York. So that's a my transcript of what what he said there. He, Doctor Goodell, kept the receipt of the medicines that he gave to to, um, to Cheever. And it's hard to read, but it was eight quarts of port wine, ten dollars, 
one quart of brandy, one dollar, and one dram of sulfate of morphine, one dollar. So he spent basically he he treated uh, this dysentery or whatever the ailment was in his gut with with wine and a little bit of morphine. Now, if you've ever seen my talks, you know I always like to know well, what happened afterwards. What happened to all these guys? So let's see. Captain Elder, who was dismissed. Thanks to the internet, I found a copy of the Army and Navy Gazette from 1864. Captain Elder is dismissed for being AWOL. He's thrown out of the service. Um, so maybe he wasn't the best soldier. Maybe it wasn't a political thing. Maybe he just couldn't administer the, the camp properly. And I, I checked the 1870 and 1880 censuses, and this guy has disappeared. No idea what, what happened to James Elder. No gravestone on find a grave. Nothing. Captain Shortley, uh, by the end of the camp, he has been promoted to major. Um, he goes back into the service, and his fingers are blown off by a mine at Petersburg in 1864. However, he recovers, and he stayed in the regular army until 1883. He died in Florida, where he was on vacation, and there's his tombstone in uh, Lewisburg Cemetery. I don't think Find a Grave existed when Doug Harper wrote the book, so... Um, Researchers are really fortunate to, have, to be able to go into find a grave and newspapers.com that were not available in the past. So I, between luck and research, I found a lot about these people. There's Lieutenant John Barber from Westchester. After the camp closes, he's a, he was a lieutenant, but he re-enlisted as a private in the 5th U.S. Artillery. And he stayed in the Army till 1869. I found him in the 1870 census living here in Westchester. He's married and he's a sales agent. However, by 1907, he's in the old soldier's home in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is basically for guys who had no wife, no family, they're destitute. They were sent to a number of these homes around the country. So he dies in this old soldier's home. Here's his tombstone, Lieutenant Barber. Sergeant Bridgewater, the, the clerk with the beautiful handwriting, he leaves Camp Elder and he decides he's going to become a, a, an officer in the 37th U.S. Colored Troops. Um, as you may know, U.S. Colored Troops. Uh, had to be officered by white men. You couldn't rise above the rank of sergeant if you were a black man. So he he uh, joins the 37th U.S. Colored Troop and he fights at New Market Heights. Uh, New Market Heights is the first battle where a, a colored soldier wins the Medal of Honor. Uh, he was not in the 37th U.S. Colored Troop, but at that battle it was it was. Uh, very important for the U.S. Colored Troop to show that, yes, they can fight. Um, he died at the, this hospital in Chesapeake, uh, Virginia, in 1864. As you know, more people died, more soldiers died in the Civil War from disease than died from uh, combat. Dr. William Goodell. He goes on from Westchester to become a nationally recognized pioneer in obstetrics and gynecology. And it's due to his work that uh, it finally made it safer for a woman to have a baby in a hospital than at home. And he was so prominent that there's still a faculty chair at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital that's named the, the Goodell Chair. Uh, he died relatively young at 65 in uh, 1894. He's buried in West Laurel Hill Cemetery. I went down there with his descendant, and we found there was no uh, GAR 
marker and flag on his grave. So we, we took care of that. Don He, the young lad, he goes back to Westchester. He grows up. He becomes commissioner, of, streets commissioner in Westchester. He's active in Fame Fire Company and other civic organizations. And it was his daughter who preserved uh, six cartes de visites from the prisoners that uh, CCHS has. He died in uh, July of 1929 and buried in Rosedale uh, in the Friends Cemetery in Rosedale Avenue. Um, I had a hard time finding that. I had to scrape it off, and sure enough, they found it. Captain McIrvin, uh, he was promoted to a major. He goes back to uh, Virginia. Within a month, he's captured by the rebels again, and he's sent to the notorious Libby Prison in Richmond uh, for six months until he's exchanged. Um, he then goes to serve in the Shenandoah Valley campaign with General Sheridan. And in those days, they didn't give very many medals, but what you wanted to do was get mentioned in the dispatches. So in the after action reports from the Shenandoah campaign, he's, his name is actually mentioned. He went back to Indiana, and I found him in a directory in 1887. He's a grocer, a farmer, a mason, and quote, thoroughly Republican. <laughs> his date of death is unknown, but his uh, widow filed for a pension on April 6, 1908, so he probably died on that date or within a day or two before. Lieutenant Wheeler, he became a captain after uh, his release, and by the end of the war, he too was a major. He moved from uh, West Virginia to Ohio, where he died in 1914. Captain Southwell, or Cor Corporal Southwell, he was wounded at the Battle of Wilderness in May of 1864. He too goes through officer's training and he's appointed captain of the 29th U.S. Colored Troops, which was raised in Illinois. And he's mentioned in this Black Civil War Soldiers book. In 1920, he's living with his son in Georgia. And he makes time to return here to Westchester and he visits with the Jeffers and the Darlington people that were so kind to him during the war. He died in 1931 and is buried in Susquehanna. Now, every soldier I've ever known once on his tombstone, the highest rank he achieved. You don't put you were a private if you made it to lieutenant. He was a, a, a captain in the 29th U.S. Colored Troop. Yet his gravestone just says corporal on it. And again, we wonder, was there some, some reason why you didn't want to be associated with colored troops. I mean, in 1931, um, why wouldn't that say on a captain? But it doesn't. So it's one of those curiosities. Um, we don't know the, the reason. Private Dennett, the guy who lost his canteen, he went back to Massachusetts and I found in newspaper.com which father's business had advertised, and it was a pain business, and uh, he decided he was going to be a shoemaker instead. Lo and behold, I find death records. He died at age 56, chronic alcoholism. So I guess he had more than one canteen. <laughs> Corporal Cheever, he died uh, November 8th. 1863, and his body was sent home to uh, New Haven, uh, New York, and he's buried in Oswego. And on his tombstone, it just says he died for his country. <laughs> Don't know that. But we do know from Dr. Goodell's file, a year later, he sends him his father $8 
And it says there it's a draft on the US government. The US government gave them eight dollars to bury him. Very generous. That's what 250 in today's month. Now we come to this improbable love story. Right out of Hollywood. Remember, I said Corporal Nolan was a uh, an Irish lad, came here in his 20s. He, he comes to Ohio, he fights, gets captured at Gettysburg, sent to Westchester and West Ham. He applies for work at the farm of Anthony and Ellen Kirk. He gets over to the farm and lo and behold, Mrs. Kirk is a girl he used to date back in Ireland. Unbelievable. There's a picture of the... Uh, the Kirk House, there on Chip and Lane. Um, her husband, Anthony, died December 31st, 1863. We don't know why. <laughs> There's his tombstone at St. Agnes, a uh, beloved husband of Ellen Kirk. Well, what happens? Well, he's dead. We know from uh, the records that Nolan, who, whose uh, his enrollment was up in the middle of 1864, in January of 1864, two weeks after Anthony's death, he tells the, his officers he's not going to re-enlist. Maybe he got a letter from, from Ellen, I don't know. He says he's not going to re-enlist, and most of his regiment does re-enlist, so they, they put him in the 75th Ohio for a, a couple of months. He returns to West Town after he gets out of the Army, and according to his obituary in the Daily Local, their old love and affection for each other returned. And he married the widow Kirk, and he ran the farm. Uh, they ended up having uh, four daughters. He died in 1885, and his his uh, funeral uh, was at St. Agnes in Westchester. And um, the obituary said he was in he was put in Oakland Cemetery. Well, I couldn't find anything in Oakland, and it turns out that in early days St. Agnes had a piece of consecrated ground in Oakland, but at some point they split off and have their own cemetery there on, uh, on uh, 100 North. Uh, within days, we, I found in the files that Ellen sold off the farm to uh, one of her daughters from her first marriage. And she went and lived with her her daughter's in Philadelphia. She died in 1915, and the last Nolan daughter died in 1959. Well, it, it bothered me that I couldn't find where Corporal Nolan was buried. So I, uh, I went over to St. Agnes, and... Uh, in their records, we found where the, the Kirk plot was. And we went over and I, that's, you know, I found uh, her first husband, Anthony's grave. And uh, according to the records at St. Agnes, there had been a burial next to her husband. We knew it wasn't her, she's buried in Philadelphia. So I assumed that, you know, maybe it was Thomas Nolan. So we went over and the caretaker got out one of those things and he dips it into the ground and sure enough, it hits a coffin lid. So St. Agnes said, fine, if you can get a marker, we'll put it here. I applied to the Veterans Affairs in Washington. We got a nice grave marker for Thomas Nolan. So his burial is no longer unknown and uh, He's resting in peace in St. Agnes. That's the end for now. There's always things turning up.
Uh, somebody asked me, is there any relics from Camp Elder? And it, it's never been used except as a farm. And John Hoppy, who was a member of our commission and lived down that way, did a, uh, I guess he, he searched with one of those magnetic detectors. And he found along uh, Goose Creek at the site of Camp Elder, the remains of an iron skeleton key. So we can't prove that it was at Camp Elder, but we know that the ground was never used for anything else. So this may be, maybe this is the key to Dr. Goodell's medicine locker or something, but that's all we have left, uh, except for the marker. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. I just have thought because there's only one mic, so somebody has a question. Can you kind of repeat the question? Sure. The question for the, the people. Sure. Tom. Uh, the question is after the camp closed, was it used for the black soldiers? Uh, no, at that point they had um, they had already established Camp William Penn up in Cheltenham, Pennsylvania. And uh, they used that instead. So it, it reverted back to Farmer Williams until eventually he, he sold it. And uh, I had the honor of living on his property. <laughs> yes. Uh, good question. They could have could have been, um, as I recall. Well, Sam, Samuel Barber was an uh, organist at uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church, and I had occasion to uh, research some of the stuff because he he actually wrote some music that. Westminster has across the street here. And I believe the Barber family he was related to came to Westchester after the Civil War. But perhaps they were following uh, cousins or, or something. But that's that's interesting. Uh, um, not a lot of people know Samuel Barber is associated with Westchester and with the church across the street here. Sir. How many acres large was it? It's approximately 15 or 20 acres. And we think most of the tents were on the flat ground between the creek and South Concord Road, because as you get to the railroad, there's an embankment and then there's a, a, a cut through a, the, the granite hillside. So they were probably on the flat ground along the creek. And it was mostly tents, so there's we're not going to find the foundations of any building or anything like that. Anything else? Sir? We we know where uh, the the question is: Do we have we out, outlined the camp on the? Any other? Yes. The GAR markers. The Grand Army of the Republic was uh, 
probably the most powerful political organization after the Civil War up until about 1900. It had almost a million members who were former soldiers in the Union Army. <clears throat> and if you recall history, except for Grover Cleveland, all those presidents in those days were Republicans. So the GAR um, basically told the government what to do in terms of pensions and that sort of thing. And they started uh, marking graves, the local GAR posts. There was two in West, three in Westchester, two white and one black posts. Um, they have these medallions that see GAR 1861, 1865. And you put the medallion in the ground and it has room to hold a flag. So if you go through any of the cemeteries around here, especially after Memorial Day, you'll see the flags in a holder. And it's, you've got a Revolutionary War, you have 1812, Civil War, World War I, II, whatever. So they're, they're, Have we been in touch with the uh, sawmill court uh, developers? Um, no, it, at the time we did the uh, marker in 2013, the Homeowners Association for Wild Goose Farms uh, signed off on the marker and were part of that ceremony we had. Um, sawmill court at the time was owned by some little manufacturing company and there had been a uh, a sawmill and some other things there first, but um, we're not sure really that the camp extended that far up. And uh, the trouble is that site would have been contaminated uh, with all sorts of nuts and bolts and things like that from the various businesses that were there over the years. Anything else? <laughs> The main did I look into other parolee camps? There wasn't any in this area. The main camp was in Annapolis, Maryland, Camp Parole, and that was the uh, the official uh, Union uh, parole camp. And the Rebs had one in uh, in Richmond, and. Uh, when it was your turn to be paroled, you were brought there to Annapolis. Uh, the rebel soldiers were brought to Annapolis, sent down on a boat to Fort Monroe, and the rebs would bring the Union prisoners to Fort Monroe, and they would get on a ship and come back. So that was the official camp here. There was one in the West. I'm not sure exactly where, maybe in Memphis or somewhere along the Mississippi. But um, I'm aware of that, but I think that was more a uh, a hospital or something. I we I briefly looked into that, and I I really can't recall the story. But there was no parole camp along the Schuylkill River. There was plenty of large military hospitals in in Philadelphia because Philadelphia was actually the medical capital of the United States during the Civil War. And uh, so much so that there were 500 graduates from Jefferson and Penn that served as surgeons in the rebel army. So it was the whole country came to Philadelphia to learn medicine. Now, there's my phone going. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much.
Okay, 